God is good, amen? Yeah, surely goodness follows after me, amen. Yesterday I was at a store. I've got to tell the story. It's, it's driving me bonkers. I was at a store. My son needed jeans. We go to the area where they had the jeans, and everything was marked in sections, and they had it by price, and they were show it. They were even taped up at the very top to show each section divided by and, and what area these jeans were. So we go to them, and there is a section that said 1799 jeans. Mark said, I need these kind of jeans. Let me get them. And he goes and he tries them on. We search through them. We find the jeans. He goes off. He he tries them on. They fit perfect. Everything was great. We go to pay for them, two pair of jeans, and they said it'll be $65. And I said, no, that's not correct. I said, it's it's back there. And he was paying for them with his own money. I said, no, they're in the the $17 section, $17.95. And he said, uh, well, let's go look. And so we go back there, and I'm with the manager, and we go look. We pass all the other sections. We get to the $17.99 section, look through them. I said, see, all these jeans are the same, and they're underneath them. And he goes, well, they're clearly marked that this is not where they belong. They're supposed to be back over here. And I was like, well, they're not, they're not clearly marked, right? And he was like, and they're clearly marked. It says it right here. And even though it's there, and I was like, well, why is it under this section? And, and he's kind of arguing with me. I was like, look, it's, is, is it clearly marked or is it not clearly marked? And he was like, I think it's clearly marked. Now, to me, he was looking at me like I was asking this ridiculous question. Like, is it clearly marked or is it not? It's clearly marked on it. I tell you that story because I can't get it out of my head. It's driving me bonkers about this. Now, he acted like it was a ridiculous question. Well, I got me thinking about that is part of what we're going to be preaching about uh, in the series we're going to be looking on in the book of Malachi. So you can open up your book in the book of Malachi, your Bible, uh, which, by the way, a lot of people will say the Bible is a book. I don't believe it's a book. I believe it's 66 books put together. It is a library of God's word for you. I want you to open it up. It's in Malachi. As we get there, the title of the series we're going to be looking at is There Are No Ridiculous Questions Except Maybe, and there are. You don't know if there's ridiculous questions until you have a seven-year-old. And the seven-year-old will ask you the most crazy questions you could ever imagine. Dad, do you think you could beat up Bruce Lee? What a ridiculous question! Of course I could beat up Bruce Lee. He'll ask me the wildest things that you could ever imagine. And you just look at him, you're like, how ridiculous. And you don't want to do that. They used to tell you that in school. There are no dumb questions. Now, I bet I can put it out there for you. But there are some that are very good. There's questions that are great. Like, uh, is baptism essential to salvation? Are you secure in your salvation? What is your eschatology, meaning the end times? Is there a rapture? Is there pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation? Even to the point, and this is serious, I'm not playing around. Do my animals go to heaven? To you, they may seem, and sometimes, depending on how mature you are, that those are ridiculous questions. They're not. Based on where you are in your spiritual growth, those are very important questions, not ridiculous questions. In the book of Malachi, though, God's people and the people of Israel at this particular time are asking very serious questions that are kind of ridiculous They don't understand the depth of what they're asking. And as you look at it, you would be just shocked that they would ask these questions. I want you to look with me in Malachi chapter 1, 1 through 5. Bear with me if I stumble over the words. I'm still having a a little bit of a tough time reading right now. Malachi chapter 1. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord. But you ask... How have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. And even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into wasteland, and I gave his inheritance to the desert desert jackals. Though Edom says, we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins 
The Lord of hosts says, They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called a wicked country, and the people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this, and you yourselves will say, The Lord is great, even beyond the borders of Israel. So this is Israel's ridiculous question that they're going to ask. The word of the Lord coming through Malachi, and by the way, I've had people say, is it Malachi or is it Malachi? He is not an Italian prophet. It is not Malachi. It is Malachi. To the, through Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Well, I want you to understand what's going on in the background of this passage. Israel had been in captivity multiple times, but this time had been a long time in captivity. They had been granted to go back to Jerusalem. They were granted to rebuild the walls and try to reset what Jerusalem was going to be. Malachi is coming during that time, and he's speaking to the people, and he's trying to talk to them about what the truth of God is saying to them. And so through the prophet, a word that is spoken to him, he is going to declare to the people, God loves you. Now, do you understand what a prophet is? A prophet was one that was speaking on behalf of the Lord. You have 66 books that are given to you, all inspired by the Lord. God written, inspired, theonoustos, God inspired. He breathed the words of God, all true, every last bit of it, spoken to us. During that particular time, prophets would have to rise up and they would speak the words that God would say to them to the people. That does not mean that I do not believe God can still, still speak to people. There are many times where I get ready to prepare a message and God changes the message, tells me to preach something else. I, I totally understand that. But during this time, this was the one that was to declare the voice of God to the people. There are people even now, in, in Scripture, as you look at what it talks about and what end times look like, there are those that are warned. Jesus says it five times more than any other warning. Beware of the false prophets and the false teachers. They're out there. I kid you not, about a month and a half ago, I had somebody called me, and they told me that God spoke to them, and I was supposed to leave this church and go pastor a church in Oklahoma. Sorry, guys. You know what I told them? Can you tell God to speak to me about that? Right? A lot of people will rise up and say, God said, you better make absolutely certain that God truly said it, if you're going to say it. God speaks to Malachi right now a very important message. And as Malachi is talking to him, he says, this is what the Lord says, I have loved you you. Oh, he has. He loved them so much. And here's how the people responded. How have you loved us? How ridiculous. How ridiculous that they can't see it. How ridiculous the question comes up. How have you loved us? How have you shown us love? We, we don't understand. We don't see it. It is amazing how we have the ability so often to look backwards and see what God has done. When we're going through the midst of the trials that are there, we can't understand what God is doing. When we're looking backwards, we can see hope. We can see God's hand through it. But when we're going through it, we don't understand. And here's the people of Israel, frustrated, struggling, watching as their nation has been in ruins, getting allowed to rebuild, hearing the message. Imagine them tired and exhausted, enemies all around. And he says, God loved you. And they're looking going, how? How has God loved us? So... The prophet answers the question. How have you loved us? And he says, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I've loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into wasteland and I gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. 
Though Edom says, we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may be built, but I will demolish. They will be called a wicked country and the people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. So he gets into this answer with them and he talks to him about Jacob and Esau. Now, if you know, as he's speaking to them, they would know without a doubt who Jacob and Esau is. I will not take for granted that there are people that come to church that you automatically understand everything. I, I get it. I learn constantly the word of God, so I'm not going to pretend that everybody in here knows. So let me explain it. Jacob and Esau were twins that are born together. One came out first, and it is J or Esau. Jacob came second, and he was clutching the, the hill of, of Esau. Then, later on, they, they're completely different. One is hairy, one is aggressive and a hunter. The other one is really close to his mother and stays with him, while the other one, the hairy one, Esau, stays with the father so often. Time comes where they're coming. The oldest born first, Esau, who has the birthright, comes and he has been serving, trying to hunt for food for his father. He comes back. He's exhausted. He's tired. Jacob is making some stew and, and some red one. And Esau says, please feed me some of this. And Jacob says, well, I'll tell you what, I will give it to you if you give me the birthright of inheritance. And he says, I'm exhausted. I'm about to die. What is a birthright to me? Here, take it. And then later on, it comes to a time of blessing. And, and you know what Jacob does? He dresses up like his brother, and he goes in to his father, uh, Isaac, who can't really see real well. And he comes in, and he steals the blessing from Esau that, Jacob want, or that Isaac wanted to give. And what happened is a huge divide between Jacob and Esau. Now, for the Israelites, they would have known this story thoroughly. It was part of history that was passed down that they would recite, that they would know. It was something that they heard over and over and over again, and they got it. So when he's saying, you ask the question, how has the Lord loved you? Look, remember the story of Jacob and Esau? And he says, even so, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Huh. It's a very divisive verse, a verse that so many people put into play and they have all this contest and, and doctrines that are based upon this verse, how God loved one and hated the other. Here's what it really comes at. It's not that. In the Hebrew, what it really comes to is this. God accepted one and rejected the other. It wasn't about an absolute hate. It was rejecting the heart of what he came and what he was doing. Hmm. And he says to him, you know this. Don't you understand what God has done for this nation? Don't you understand how he loves you? And he's having to explain it to him almost like they're little children. Then he gets in this idea. It's not Jacob and Esau. He's even going further and he's talking about their heritage. And he says to him, though Edom says we have been devastated. Here's what Edom is. Jacob, who is of the people of Israel, and Eden, who becomes from the people of Esau, they come out in this land. This is their people and they are constantly trying to attack and be at war against the Israelites. He says, not only from the very people, Jacob and Esau, but to their lineage down, I have shown love. Through Edom, they say, we've been devastated, but we will rebuild. The Lord of hosts says this, they may build, but I will demolish. They'll be called a wicked country and the people the Lord has cursed forever. You, your own eyes will see this, and you yourself will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. I have done all this, the Lord says. I've shown you Jacob and Esau. I've shown you the lineage. Every time these people come up and they rise against you, I have shown you how unbelievable powerful I am. If you ever go to Israel and you look at the history of what's wrapped up in there, here's how you could describe it. You could take Egypt, you could take Babylonia, you could take all of this, and you could look at it like it's big, tough bulldogs. 
And then you could take the Philistines or you could take Edom and you could take all these in around and you could look at them like they're cats. And then you could look at Israel and it's like this small little people that are mice. And those mice over and over again whoop the cats, whoop the dogs. You know why? Because the Lord is with them. The Lord is with them. He says, haven't I shown you this? Look around you. Can't you see who you were? And look at what I have done. They're going to try to rebuild, but I'm going to destroy it over and over again. I am God and I am with you. You ask how I loved you? Look at what I have done for you. Oh, what a ridiculous question. But I'm going to do so much that you can't help but praise my holy name. You're going to see it so much. What is it it says right there? Your own eyes will see this in verse 5, and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. You're going to see it, and the name is going to be great. If you even want to know about this, here's what you can see. Even beyond the borders of Israel, here is what God has done. To the moment that Jesus Christ came into this earth, died on the cross, resurrected from the grave, the moment Pentecost happened and the word of the Lord and the Spirit came upon them and they spoke in their own languages, people were hearing them in their own dialect and the gospel went forth. The moment that persecution ended the land and they tried to stop the movement of Christianity, the gospel was grown. All those that were persecuted left their land and they started proclaiming claiming the gospel everywhere they went, all the way to the point that you sitting in this very room have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus has gone out from the borders of even Israel. And the glory of the Lord is obvious. But, but, this ridiculous question that the Israelites ask, is a question that people still ask today, even for Christians. How? How has the Lord loved us? Well, I'll give you two definitive answers. I'll give you one, a very simple one. It's got four Ps that I'll give you so that you can remember this. Are you ready? Very simple answer and obvious one. How about personhood? Do you think God loves you? Everybody that's sitting in this room that you have breath, you have life. It shows God's love for you. Am I right? Amen. Every last one of us shows God's love for you. Every little baby that has born in this world, God loves. And he brought him in. This is, this is the world. We have life. You have a heart. You have eyes that can see. Or some of you have eyes that can see. You have this. You have ears to hear. You have all of this in front of you. God has given this to you. You have personhood. What about this? Prayer. Do you guys think that prayer is absolutely special? The other day we were praying. There was a lady here in the church, uh, Jamie Dillard, who, who they sat right behind me back over here. And, and uh, they have believed that, that there was something. Her hair had started falling out. She's very vocal about it. And the hair started falling out almost to 90%. They could not figure out what it was. Uh, they struggled with it. They challenged. They were going to have to go through all these procedures. And, and they were going to do the first procedure. And they went and did the first procedure. Two days after it was over, she started feeling so good. They go through the procedure and they go test her to see her levels. And they were like, your levels are absolute perfect. Your hair is about to start growing back again now I believe in the power of prayer and I believe that God can answer it whether it is through doctors or whether it's through divine healing we have a God that listens to us and by the way I don't feel like he should have to I feel like like Clint saying to me daddy could you beat up Bruce Lee I ask and I say some of the dumbest things, and the Lord still listens to me. Isn't that amazing? You have life. You have communication with the Father. Man, look at this. What about protection? Has God ever protected you in your life? 
Can, can I just tell you, there are people right now that will meet in other countries that they have to go underground, they have to figure out ways. I've heard stories about how they will ride bicycles to one place, there will be somebody that will have a bicycle at that place, they'll take it, they'll ride backwards, they have to get into a taxi to go another way, they'll get into a subway and they'll go another way and they do all of this to get to this place of this underground church just so they can meet for freedom under fear of persecution. But you get to come into this church and hear a long-winded preacher. You get to come in freedom. I would say that even living in this country with all the freedoms we have is showing God's protection of us. Do you ever get up and just say, thank God that I'm born here? How privileged and how lucky we are. He's given us life the ability to talk to the Father, and He's protected us from so many different ways. I, I can preach the gospel, and very rarely do I have to fear any kind of persecution that comes my way at all. At all. He's protected me. I have so much in my life. No matter what my broken childhood looked like, I still had food on the table. I have been protected, and I have been blessed. And what about this? Not only does he give us personhood, life, prayer to talk to him, protection in our life, but he gives us people that loves us. Do you think you have people in your life that love you? I want you to look around the room for just a second. I want you to look at everybody. There are so many people in here that you probably do not have a lot in common with. Do you understand? There's people that come from different regions and different areas and different locations, different countries. And all of them have come into this very room and we get to worship the Lord. There's some of us that come with different backgrounds that we did in school. And yet here we are sitting together worshiping the Lord. God has given us people that pray for each other, that love each other, that care for each other, that when you're hurting, we hurt for you. Whenever you're rejoicing, that we rejoice with you. That's what a church family is supposed to do, and God has provided it for us. The simple answer is you have life, you have prayer, you get to be protected, and you have people that love you, and we take it for granted all the time. God, how have you loved me? Okay, so if the simple answer is not enough, how about we go into a little bit more complex and divine answer? How about His mercy and His grace? His mercy and His grace. I want to read a passage to you in Titus 3, 4, going through 7. But when the goodness of God and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the worshiping of regeneration, or from the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out this Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we have become heirs with the hope of eternal life. He did this according to mercy, and he did it according to grace. Do you understand what mercy is? Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. You know what we deserve? We chose a life of rebelliousness. We deserve any kind of punishment that would come. But he showed us grace and he spared us from that. When I was a kid, I had this uncle. I still have him and he's still a monster. I'm, I'm talking not mean, but physically. You know what they call him? His nickname is Tiny. You can only imagine how big he is. I'm talking a big old guy, 6'3", probably. He, he weighed over 300 pounds. Big, big guy. And when I got into wrestling, he would want to wrestle with me all the time. And it got to the point that my big old strong, huge uncle, I found out he wasn't very athletic. And so I would take him and I would get him down and I would whoop him for, I'm talking almost an hour, I would be on top of him just whooping him and whooping him and whooping him and whooping him. And do you know what he would do at the end? He would cheat. 
And he would grab the inside of my leg and he would start squeezing it. And all of a sudden, all my wrestling went out of the window and I started screaming like a little child. Ah, ah, ah. And he would say, I'll let go if you say I am the greatest uncle. And I would try everything I could to try to not to say it. I'd say, no, you're a good guy. Nope, that's not what I told you. <laughs> I, I love you. That's not what I told you. Say it. Who's the greatest uncle? I can't. I'm not going to say it. And then I would start naming all my other uncles. Uncle Terry's the greatest uncle. And he would squeeze harder. Uncle Dale, Uncle Dale. He'd squeeze a little harder. Finally, I would have to call out, okay, you're the greatest uncle. You're the greatest uncle. And he would release me. You know what it was? He was showing me mercy because I was in his hands. And there was nothing I could do about it. It's Saul on the road to Damascus going to persecute all the church, getting ready to kill, breathing threats against him. And all of a sudden the Lord appears to him and it shuts him down and he can't see anything anymore. And he says to him, Saul, Saul, why have you persecuted me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Meaning, who are you that is in complete control of me? I can do nothing but surrender to you right now. He gave you life. He gave you prayer. He, he gave you the, the opportunity to be protected. He, he gave you all of the people around you that love you. But one of the greatest gifts he gave was not giving you what you deserve. He showed you mercy. And then you know what he gave you? Grace. Grace is not giving me what I did deserve and giving me what I didn't deserve. I'm not, at my nature, a good person. I was ornery through school. I battled with struggles now. I, there's so many things. That guy yesterday at that store, man, I kept envisioning me body slamming him. <laughs> I did. I'm not lying to you. Like, it, it rises up within me at times. I didn't do it, so God's working on me, right? And it rises up. It struggles. I'm, I'm not. I'm not good. But that Holy Spirit lives within me. Because one day, I called out to him as Jesus is Lord. And I believed in my heart that God raised me from the dead. And scripture says if you do that, you will be saved. Saved is not just spared from the depths of hell. Saved is not just the fact that, that I get to walk away from my sinfulness and be forgiven. Saved is I get the promise of everlasting life to be in heaven in the wonderful relationship with the Father. And he took me and he grabbed me and he protected me. And I deserved none of it. I deserved wrath. And I deserved punishment. But he loved me anyway. How has God loved me? My childhood is miserable. The things that I'm facing, work is tough. The, the people around me, my neighbors are mean. The persecution we feel, the country that's absolutely divided. All of these struggles. How has God loved me? Well, I want you to know there's not one situation you've ever went through that can take Jesus Christ from the cross and sit there and say he's not strong enough to pay the price for that. He looked down the world of creation, knew who you were, took every sin you ever committed, got on the cross, died for you, rose again, gave you the promise of everlasting life because God so loved the world. How has God loved me? Well, he met me where I was at and he gave me what I didn't deserve. We're not Israel. We're not. But we ask that same ridiculous question. How have you loved us? Friends, can I tell you something? He loves you so much that well, while you were yet sinners, he died for you. Yeah. 
years ago at a church, we did this thing called the, the cardboard testimonies. Have you ever seen these? And what you do is you come out and you have something that you went through, some sinfulness, some hurt, some struggle, and you show it on the cardboard. And then what you do is you flip it over and you show what God did for you. So like we had somebody that came out and they said, I was a drug addict and I lost my children. And then they flip it and say, but God redeemed me and I went to rehab and he saved me and I have my children back now. Somebody else would come in and say, I was an alcoholic, but God saved me from it. And you kept doing it over and over. We had one person that came forward. Her husband didn't even know about it. She said, I was raped as a child by my stepbrother, but God has given me forgiveness, so I will forgive him. Whew. And then we had this lady, and she started walking down from the balcony. I knew she was coming. Church didn't know. And everybody's looking at her. She was the one that like the ladies in the church all looked up to. She was the one that whenever she said she was going to pray for you, you knew without a doubt she was going to pray for you. Man, she loved the Lord. And she walks down, was about as good natured and kind as anybody you ever met. And she walks down and she holds up a sign and it was talking about the prostitution that she went through strung out on drugs, all this stuff that she did. And then she flipped it over and she said, God spared me from all of that because I accepted Jesus at eight years old. There's no telling what her life could have been. But she didn't have to go through that because God saved her soul. How has God loved us? Uh, let me count the ways. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray today as many of us are dealing with frustrations and hurts and struggles, and we get to that point where we just sit there and say, God, how have you loved us? Where are you? That we could say, and we could take a breath in our lungs and we could realize you gave us that breath. That we can sit there and we can realize that we get to call out to you even when we're asking that question, where were you, where are you? That we get to call out to you and you, the living God, hear us. That we get to realize that we will leave this place and we will get to go to restaurants and choose what we want to eat. We get to leave church and, and we will beat the Methodists because we're going to get out early. We're, we're going we're gonna to go and we're going to get to eat and we get to talk about the air conditioning was too cold or the, it was too hot. We, we get to talk about how long-winded, what songs we liked, what songs we didn't. We live in a wonderful place where you have showed us people that love us and we are so privileged. How have you loved us? I get to go to bed tonight. And I get to know I am your child. And that I am secure in you. And your Holy Spirit convicts me. Lord, I get to go tonight. And I get to look at what you spared me from. Because I didn't leave didn't deserve grace. I deserved something worse. But you loved me anyways. Lord, I pray that those that are here today, if they've never experienced that love and they've never truly called out to you and they sit there and they realize they want that love in their life, that they will come forward right now, confess Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart, God raised them from the dead, follow through with the process of, of being baptized, walk in obedience. But I can't make anybody do that, Lord. God, maybe there's those that are here that they've been wrapped up in bitterness and it's time to lay it at the altar. 
said, God, I don't want to carry this anymore. You forgave me, I'll forgive others. I want to leave it here. Maybe there's those that feel like this is the church family for them and they need to come down. Whatever it is, Lord, will you speak to the hearts of your people? And whatever they need to do, may they come forward now. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name.